seminar. I'm Frank James. I'm chair of Shack, and this is a part of our continuing online seminar series that we began during the pandemic and have continued since then because they have worked. Uh, could everybody um, uh, mute their uh, microphone, please, uh, while Adrian talks for sort of 20 to 30 minutes, uh, followed by 30 minutes discussion? And this is also being relayed live on YouTube. Um, in the discussion, anybody on Zoom uh, comment, uh, and I'll call them in sort of roughly the order that they appear on my screen, uh, um, that will be passed to me. So this month's um, seminar is by Dr. Adrian Wilson, uh, who sort of tells me he migrated not only from Australia to Britain, but also from science to social. Um, uh, uh, and, and social history at the University of Now. Lost you, Frank. I think you may have lost me there. Can you hear me, Rob? Are you Adrian? I, I can hear you, yes. I can hear you now and see you. Right. Sometimes it. I, I don't know what's happening. What's happening here? Um, Frank, might I suggest that we just, given that you're having trouble with your microphone, can I suggest we move straight into uh, um, Adrian's talk? Yeah, um, I'm going to um, uh, take my video off in case that in that case that helps. Okay, um, uh, Adrian has worked in Sussex, Cambridge, Leicester, and is now at the University of Leeds. He edited *Rethink Social History*, uh, has has written *The Making of Man Midwifery*, uh, 1995, and *Ritual and Conflict*, 2014. Uh, and most recently, his article, The Great Instauration of the 18th Century, has appeared in uh, a, a Michael Bycroft and Adrian Wilson's uh, special issue of Journal of Early Modern Studies uh, on addressing the 18th century problem 40 years on. So, Adrian, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Frank, and thank you very much for this invitation. So the title of some discontinuities in 18th century instrumentation could we have a second slide, please? We'll move down to number two, thanks. So the one slide introduction, then uh, I think it's seven slides on the pneumatic trough, four on the thermometer, and three on the obliteration of discontinuity. So my argument is going to be there were, in fact, discontinuities in these matters in the pneumatic trough and the thermometer. These have been historiographically obliterated. I'm trying to bring those discontinuities to light. So, um, to the next slide, please. Thank you. So, um, my credentials for this are zero. I'm not a historian of chemistry. All of what I have to say is going to be based on secondary sources. So what brings me to this? What's the motivation? It's the paper that Frank just mentioned. And in that paper, we can work out the argument of the paper from the title. The Great Instauration of the 18th Century argues the 18th century, far from being a blank space historiographically, as Cantor pointed out, people tend to see, tended to see it, uh, was the period in saw what I call a great instauration, a realisation of Bacon's vision uh, across the board. And I gave three examples of different fields, uh, to use three examples from three different fields to try and demonstrate that. One was what I called the physico-mathematical sciences, another was electricity, and in between them was chemistry, which had a dual role. Partly it was just one of the examples, but also in, if you look textbooks of history science, such as Boulder and Morris, the, the so-called chemical revolution, so-called, is the only thing that's supposed to have happened in the 18th century. Of course, I needed to combat that. So I needed to address chemistry directly and its historiography. So that's where this came from. And what I'm going to give you is 
really straight out of the paper, but reframed in terms of discontinuity. The theme of discontinuity appears in the paper in the electricity section. I hadn't thought of it as when I wrote the paper. I hadn't thought of it as pertaining to the chemistry. Then reflecting on it afterwards, you realize, gosh, yes, it pertains to the to the chemistry, to these two um, instruments in particular, the so-called pneumatic trough and the thermometer. So that's by way of introduction. And we next jump into Stephen Hales. Next slide, thank you. So uh, Hales's vegetable statics is um, rich in invented instruments and devices. Two of them are here. The one at the bottom is the ancestor of the pneumatic trough. The one at the top is the ancestor of the ancestor. The one at the top, there's two um, figures there. It's the top one we're interested in, figure 35. That's called, I'm not sure whether it's by Hales, a pedestal apparatus. You might be able to see a candle in there. You can put things in the top. This is a little uh, um, uh, stopper at the top you can um, open and close. You can put things in. There's a column of water under there that's going to go up or down. And this is this is Hale's account of what he devised it for, to take an estimate of a quantity of air absorbed and fixed or generated by a burning candle, burning brimstone, et cetera, et cetera. That was the first apparatus. And problem was, you'd finish your experiment, you'd say, oh, this is how much air there is. All he's interested in is how much air is gained or lost. The only property of air is its elasticity, more or less. It's, it's, it's not chemically significant um, for Hales. Problem, the level goes up or down in the hours or days following the experiment. What's happening? Well, the elasticity is getting lost. And that's because, Hales reckons, the acid sulfurous fumes raised with the air resorbed, reabsorbed, and fixed the elastic particles. So how do we do that? Get rid of those acid sulfurous fumes. And how do you do that? You wash your air as it goes into the receiver, hence that new apparatus at the bottom. The water, the, sorry, the air coming out of the fire on the right in the bottom illustration bubbles up through the water, and the water is getting rid of those um, acid, spirit, and sulfurous fumes. That's the apparatus that is the ancestor of the pneumatic trough. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, I won't dwell on this because it's, 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 ooh, yeah. That's, um, this is going to be uh, appear twice more. This is a little quotation from the classic article on the pneumatic trough, dates 1969 by John Paris Candola and Aaron Ivey, called History of the Pneumatic Trough. Um, and that's the full key quotation that I'm working from. And could we have the next slide, please? Now, here I've highlighted the continuity elements of that um, little passage. Later, we'll see that this isn't the whole part of it. If you just look at what's in red here, we have the value of the pneumatic trough recognized after Black. And Black's work clearly established the need for techniques for the isolation of chemically produced gases. Chemists recognized this need. Cavendish, in fact, soon isolated another kind of air, first of many gases. This is a continuity story. This is continuity rhetoric. That's the thrust of the Paris Candela an ID story. Pneumatic trough invented by Hales, same instrument, find it used by Cavendish, part of a continuous story. Um, if we move to the next slide, please, we'll see that this has been the dominant view, this continuity story. So this is Carlton Perrin's account in the um, Companion of the History of Modern Science in 1990, and Galinsky's account in the Porter and the Edited Collection of 18th Century Science. 2003. I can't, I haven't come across any more recent than that I could use. So here's Perrin. Stephen Hales's discovery that air could be elicited from many substances spawned, inspired pneumatic chemistry. Continuity story. Similarly, Galinsky, 2003, following the lead of Hales, pneumatic chemistry flourished. So Hales is doing pneumatic chemistry, is the implied content of that. Um, 
there's two different stories. There's a Scottish story about the role of heat. There's an English story about the chemical characteristics of different gases initially still regarded as different species of air, which kind of implies that's how Hale saw them, which he certainly didn't. In the hands of Priestley, new gases were produced. It's another continuity story between the pneumatic trough and pneumatic chemistry, the so-called pneumatic trough and pneumatic chemistry. So I claim that this continuity story is a standard view. Now I'm going to have some slides, if I can move the next one, please, indicating discontinuities. Thank you. Coming up, I think. This is back the Paris Candolian idea, and this is what I didn't show before. The value of the pneumatic trough was not recognized until after the work of Black. Discontinuity number one. We supposedly have the instrument before Black, but its value is not mentioned until after Black. That's discontinuity number one. Discontinuity number two, Black did not himself use the trough in this work. So the manner's work is responsible for getting us, getting the pneumatic trough to ha have its value recognized, didn't himself use it. It's a double discontinuity and it's a paradox. So that's first of three slides of paradoxes. The next one, if I could, please. Somehow blank slides crept in. Don't know how that happened. My apologies if it was me. No, it's me. I pressed the wrong button. Is that the slide you want? That's it. So the term is anachronistic. Woo! We can't need to go back. Sorry. It's flying. Here we go. This is a Google engram. Uh, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but the little spike at the bottom is in the 1760s and 70s. That's when the phrase pneumatic trough is first recorded in the corpus of works uh, digitized by Google. Uh, not in the 20s, not in the 30s, not in the 40s, not in the 50s, and barely at all really in the 60s and 70s and 80s and even 90s. It's only after 1800 that we have the term. So applying it back certainly to Hales is totally anachronistic, and it's doubtful whether it's uh, not anachronistic in anybody else's hands before that. So thank you for that. That's the this company is number two and uh, one more, I think, to come. So this is a bunch of uh, activities that did not involve the pneumatic trough, took place before the work of Black and independently of Black, uh, and were crucial for or plausibly connected with and certainly with later pneumatic chemistry and constituted pneumatic chemistry in their own right, I would say. First of all, in the 30s and 40s, we have James Lowther and John Maud collecting airs. And the airs they're collecting are damps, noxious fumes from places like coal mines. Neither Lowther nor Maud used Hales' apparatus, and yet they collected airs. Justice Black didn't use Hales' apparatus, and he seems to have collected them somehow. And there are other people studying these so called damps at this time. Lane Waltier and the very interesting William Brownrigg pictured there, who also we learned from Leslie Tamori's very, very good paper, um, develops a pneumatic theory in seven, early 1740s. Doesn't get published, but papers in the Royal Society. And it's, um, well, it's remarkable. The theory of a gaseous state of matter generation before that was widely thought of. Argue for different sorts of elastic fluid, different airs, and claimed atmospheric air was a heterogeneous mixture of various elastic fluids and so on. All of this without using or referring to the pneumatic trough. So that's further discontinuities and that on the pneumatic trough. So we can now move on to thermometry. I think I'm okay for time. I've just checked. So I'm going to uh, refer to three publications. Uh, Hassock Chang's book, Charles' article, and John McCaskey's article. I'm doing it in chronological order. Uh, so 
Chang's wonderful book is, is called The Invention of Temperature, Measure, Measurement and Scientific Progress. So he has things to tell us about thermometry and from that, a couple of puzzles arise. So the main thing we learn about thermometry, this is an 18th century development. The instrument and the name thermometer date from before 1650, but thermometry, making these things do something useful, interesting and important, it's all 18th century, which you can see is grist to my great inspiration mill. Chang's core argument is that making this instrument work, as he calls it, inventing temperature, was really hard work. It was hard work philosophically. It was hard work technically. For instance, how do you define fixed points, reference points? Complicated, difficult. How do you ensure linearity between them? And how do you extend temperature once you've got that concept below your zero or above your upper limit? How, how do you do that? All of this was very difficult. All of it involved hard work. And all of these problems were, to some degree or other, cracked by the late 18th century, even though what temperature was was not a matter of agreement at all. Is it caloric? Is it motion? So that's um, a great book reduced to five lines. Apologies to Hassel. Seems to me two big puzzles arise from this. First of all, how come if the instrument was invented in the 17th century, its realisation only takes place in the 18th century? Why this 100-year gap? at least, at the very, very least, 80-year gap. Secondly, here's a paradox, and, and Chang himself admits it's a paradox in the book. We find that Celsius, to indicate only the most notable case, there are others, comes up with what Chang calls an upside-down scale. That is to say, Celsius had water boiling at naught and freezing at 100. We use what we call a Celsius scale, but we flip it. Water freezes at naught and boils at 100. And that's not how Celsius saw it. It was Linnaeus, interestingly, who flipped Celsius' scale and made it go in the direction that we have it. But there's a real puzzle here. How, how could that happen? That puzzle, I'm going to suggest, will be resolved in two slides' time, and not in the next slide, but could we have the next slide, please? Now, this is John Powers' um, equally impressive article on Barhaber and Fahrenheit and Barhaber. It's from Osara's special issue on the early 18th century chemistry. Called Measuring Fire, Heaven and Barhaber and the Introduction of Thermometry into Chemistry. Its title is very descriptive of its content. So it's a bit about, a lot about Fahrenheit, a lot about Barhaber. In my view, this, the signal importance of the article is the interaction between them. So Fahrenheit emerges as an inventor, an entrepreneur, a natural philosopher, all of those things wrapped up in one. He learns his thermometry from my room of the day, and he comes up with a new ambition of making and selling, he's an entrepreneur, remember, thermometers that are consistent with one another. And he puts huge effort into this. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Nobody else has even tried. And he pretty much succeeds. So that's Fahrenheit uh, reduced to essentials. Now, Barhaber is teaching chemistry at Leiden, as everyone knows, and he's using experimental demonstrations, as is also pretty well known. And in that context, Powers points out that for Barhaber, Fahrenheit's thermometer was a valuable tool because Barhaber has the concept of fire. And he reckons that the thermometer makes the fire visible. As your alcohol or mercury goes up in your tube, that shows how much fire there actually is. So he constructs a theory of the thermometer as a tool for showing fire, how much of it there is. So you can see from that what the punchline of this slide is. This is a mutually supportive and mutually stimulating interaction. Probably. It's hard to imagine what happened 
happening without both of those parties being involved and interacting as they did. So you've got the Boer Harbor pedagogic context and a very particular kind of pedagogic method. You've got Fahrenheit with his commercial motivation and his wonderful technical and entrepreneurial skills. Uh, so that's what we get from Powers. Now, the reason the Fahrenheit Boer Harbor interaction is so important is going to come from the next slide. And this is what we learned from John McCaskey's article published as recently as 1920. Um, and since John is in the audience here, I'm not going to um, say what, how good I think this is because it'd make him blush. Um, everything on this slide is a direct quotation from the book. I've sort of condensed it, sorry, the article, I've condensed it down. So first, if look at the red stuff and then we'll go into the detail afterwards. If this was animated, the red stuff would come up first. At first, the word temperature meant mixture, including of hot and cold, but lots of other things. Secondly, the thermometer itself had little effect on the concept of temperature. But after Fahrenheit, temperature became the degree of heat. Its, its meaning was drastically narrowed and focused and changed. And finally, in a generation after a generation, the post-Fahrenheit concept became the norm. So those are um, all, everything here is a quotation. This inverted commas I've left implicit. So that's the big picture. Now some detail. Under the first point, um, McCassie gives some examples. These are all from the 16th century. Ethicists, temperatura temperamentum, those two words, for a moderate and virtuous balance of extremes in ethics. Metallurgists, mix of metals, temperatura. Temperatura used by Erasmus for a suitable mixture of authority and obedience. So temperature means mixture. And although the thermometer was invented in the 17th century, that did not change the meaning of the word temperature. What did happen in the 17th century, and McCaskey doesn't have an explanation for this, and neither do I, is it just so happened that Latin temperatura, English temperature, kind of became less frequent, kind of dropped out. So now look at what's in green. By 1700, the term you would use for mixture and judicious mixture would be temperies, temper. You wouldn't really use, or not many people used, temperatura or temperature. There we are in 1700. We then get Fahrenheit and Boer Harbor, and after Fahrenheit, temperature became degree of heat. And now that new concept becomes the norm, and it took about a generation till about 1770s when it seems to have really crystallized and been finalized. Uh, so here's how that happened. Again, quoting from the article, natural philosophy was born after something like 1725. Felt a need to give the scale on the thermometer a name. They've got this Fahrenheit thermometers, which are reliable, and that's the key thing. So there's something real in nature that these thermometers measure. Well, what are we going to call it? You pick up that almost disused word temperature, revive it, and now give it a new application. So it's not that the meaning of the word temperature changed. Rather, it's that the meaning of the word temperature disappeared, reappeared, uh, put to a completely new use. So uh, one more slide under that heading, and we're near, near towards the end here. So I think there's a lot of considerations in support of that picture. First of all, if you go to the OED, look up the word temperature, you, what you find in it is essentially the story of changed usage that McCassie gives in the article. It also turns out that James Sumner's excellent book on brewing science uh, 
completely confirms this. Sumner is the only other historian I have found, I'm not saying there are none, but there's no others I've found, who's discussed the meaning of the word temperature, and he finds exactly the same. It's also borne out by Google and Graham. Remember, part of McCaskey's argument is that the word temperature and its Latin equivalent drops out in the course of the 17th century, so it's available to be reappropriated for this new use. There you have a Google and Graham. I think 1700 is somewhere in the middle of that. So you can see in the early 17th century, it's, temperature is quite common, drops out effectively or becomes much less used. And then in the 18th century, it picks up and it picks up. I can't see the exact date there, but it's very much in line with McCaskey's argument. Uh, another point is that this resolves both of those puzzles that emerged from Chang's book. We can now explain the 100 year gap between the invention of the thermometer and the invention of temperature. And also the upside down scales of Celsius and others uh, are intelligible. McCaskey puts it like this. This upside down scale, he doesn't put it like, use that phrase, but that's what he's referring to. Made sense. If a thermometer is measuring temperature or the degree of tempering, a higher number should indicate greater lessening of heat. So, Someone like Celsius is still working with the old concept of temperature. And finally, um, the method of mixtures, an absolutely key development of thermometry, much analysed by Chang, doesn't get put into place until around 1770. And the people who do it are Black and Deleuze. Um, and we, this we learn from Chang. And that happens in the 1770s. Well, of course, it would happen then on McCaskey's story, because it's by then that the new concept of temperature is stabilised. And so the very possibility of linearity between your fixed points uh, has become real in a way it never was before, and imaginable in a way it never was before. So that's the end of my substantive stuff. And now, uh, briefly, three slides trying to explain why these discontinuities uh, have tended to be suppressed. Can, can we just uh, stop there a minute, please, Adrian? Sorry to be a nuisance. No? I actually need to leave, not because I'm bored with your presentation, but I've got another meeting to go to. And Anna is going to take over handling your slides. So I'm going to stop sharing. Anna is going to start sharing, and we'll go on to your slide when you can have your discussion. I'm sorry no, no, to... Please. I'm sorry it's been a nuisance. That's all right. Right, I've now stopped sharing. Anna, over to you. Right, so have you have you transferred over to me, Rob? Yes, please. Brilliant, okay, here we go. Right, and then we should be on, let me just hang on, let's just go to slideshow. We had trouble with that. Is that what you were having trouble with? Yeah. Okay, right, so I just use, have you got McCaskey's picture? Can you see that? I can see some considerations in support of McCaskey's picture. Yep, yes, that's right. And All right. Well, I won't use slideshow then. I'll just keep going with this. Is that okay? That's right. Okay. Yep. Over to you, Anna. I'm sorry about this. That's Bye. okay. That's fine. Bye. Thank you, right. you. Do you want to go on to the next one, Adrian? Yes, please. Uh, I, I just paused to comment that how very appropriate I'm about to start talking about discontinuity. Um, so I'm going to suggest sort of three ways in which discontinuities get suppressed. So one is terminology. So the pneumatic trough, I've argued as a later phrase, falsely projected back onto house. And you do, if you do that, of course, you suppress any discontinuity. You create an imaginary continuity of the term. So when did that happen? How did that phrase get projected back onto house? Who did it? Why did they do it? Seems to me that will be worth looking into. And that has led to an anachronistic usage that, as far as I've been able to find, has not been shaken off. Hales is still seen as inventing a new map. So that's one way in which terminology has suppressed discontinuity. It's worked in a different way for the, word, the words temperature and thermometer, because they're not anachronistic for the period. What's anachronistic is the assumption that their meanings didn't change. And it's really remarkable that all a historian would have had to do to see a problem here is to go to the OED. But as far as I know, nobody ever did. 
So that's that one. Two to go. Two slides to go. Thank you, Hannah. Next one. Second way in which discontinuities, I suggest, tend to get suppressed. This is specific to the thermometer. I don't listen. Well, if this applies to pneumatic drop, I haven't um, identified it. But I think we can see it in the case of the thermometer. Big picture narratives. Uh, these two, Heilbronn's Elements of Early Modern Physics and Hankins' book, Science and the Enlightenment. Both date from the 1980s, both arguably yet to be superseded historiographically. So if you look at the first line under each in green, in Heilbronn's book, the invention of the thermometer of the 17th century is not mentioned. Whereas in Hankins' book, the invention of the thermometer in the 17th century is the main story. That's Hankins' main story because he's deploying the narrative frame of the scientific revolution. Everything important happened in the 17th century. So, of course, the invention of the thermometer is the key thing. So we don't get much about the 18th century. And indeed, Fahrenheit gets in there, but he's not mentioned as contributing to thermometry. So the most important person in the history of thermometry doesn't do thermometry in Hankins' book. That's the, how his, the content is poisoned by the narrative frame. Go back to Heilbronn, he's got a different narrative frame. His narrative frame comes from Kuhn's paper, Mathematical versus Experimental Traditions. Um, and it's an important argument in that paper that experimental stuff like chemistry, heat, thermometry, that's all going to get mathematized in the late 18th century. So the late 18th century is when everything happens. So what do we get in Harborough? Well, we don't have a thermometer invented in the 17th century, as I've already said, nor do we get any mention of early 18th century developments at all. The only thing that's said about thermometry in that book is the late 18th century increase in precision, which is exactly the same as measures as barometers as electrometers. All these instruments improved late 18th century it entirely fits that Kuhnian narrative, and of course, it's suppressed um, crucial things. And once again, Fahrenheit has disappeared. Uh, one more slide, thanks, Anna. So, uh, this is a bit more speculative. Um, revolution tool. I'll just throw out this possibility that maybe. We historians of science in general, uh, it's a bit cheeky to count myself as a historian of science. I'm a historian of medicine, trespassing in history, history of science. Maybe we tend to deploy a Kuhnian normal science, revolutionary science dichotomy without realizing it. Suppose we do, then you won't have a discontinuity unless you can call it a revolution. So I'll call that deflation. Conversely, uh, John Christie is right here with Jan Galinsky in 1982, identified something which I'm going to call inflation. Inflation, opposite the equation. The willingness of historians of chemistry, I just love this sentence, and more generally of science to work up to summary and definitional moments is very strong. The Bavius, Lavoisier, Alan, Lavoisier or Dalton, it's a wonderful sentence. So I'll call that inflation. I want to suggest inflation, deflation, two sides of the same coin. Either way, discontinuities of the kind I've been talking about tend to disappear. They're not big enough to be revolutions, so they disappear. And lastly, very briefly, I wonder about SSK, because as far as I can see, SSK doesn't have a narrative dimension. So the inference of SSK may have diverted attention away from um, historical change processes like these discontinuities. That's it. Thank you very much for your patience and for this invitation. Thank, thank you, Adrian. That was really informative and uh, interesting, and I think possibly a bit provocative. Um, but oh, I hope so. of our audience might be able to sort of comment on that. Um, can I sort of kick off 
using my usual chair's prerogative of asking the first question, is that where does that leave your grand narrative about the chemical revolution? What a good question. The honest answer is I don't know. A good question. Because I mean, I take I take the point about I take the point about discontinuities could imply a revolution of some sort, a sort of um, um, micro revolution. Um, but I mean, the I mean, do you actually accept that there was such a thing as Lavoisier transforming chemistry in such a way that is reasonable? Not really, no. Good, not good. really. No, I'm, 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 I'm not a skeptic of a Lavoisierian transformation of chemistry. I am a very much a skeptic of the term chemical revolution, and I hate the, the, the term chemical revolution when the word the is put before it. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm not I, I'm not of the same um, view as Ursula Klein. He says there was no revolution uh, associated with Lavoisier. Um, I think if anything is going to count as a revolution, what Lavoisier did is going to be an instance of it. Dalton might be another. Davy might be another to personalise it and individualise it, which of course you shouldn't anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I can't go with this to a Klein's view. But um, I, I just think that the, the, concept, the concept is, I mean, the person I'd like to hear commenting on this is John, John Christie, who indicated in that article with Andrew Ritsky way back then in 82, it's a problematic concept. I think it's remained as problematic since, if not more so, as, as you know, it's still at least as problematic as it was then, I suspect more so. But sorry, okay. no proper answer to your question. Okay. Good that's, question. That's fair enough. It's a discussion. I no right answers here after all. Um, so, John Christie has. Thank you, Frank. Uh, um, two comments. John. Uh, can everybody hear? Yep. Okay. Thanks very much, Adrian. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, paper as usual and thank you for your kind comments on a sentence I'd forgotten about writing all that long time ago. Anyway, uh, uh, just a couple of comments. Um, one sort of factual and one more conceptual. Um, uh, the brown rig you chose on, on the fire damps and not using uh, the Halesian apparatus, but he then later was awarded, uh, I think the Copley Medal uh, for his study of airs in spa waters, uh, in which he did use uh, the pneumatic trough, and but with his own adaptations to it, uh, he used it very extensively. Yeah, um, so one might consider filling out the history of the pneumatic trough in that positive sense with brown rig, uh, which is occurring before Priestley's uh, uh, use of it, for instance. Um, my other uh, comment is just on temperature. And that is on um, post Fahrenheit developments. Okay, well, um, key development there picked out by John McCaskey is um, uh, uh, what is temperature? It is degree of heat. But is that a real property? A point also made, I think, by John McCaskey. Uh, that is what precisely is being measured. And can it be uh, indeed even considered a measurement, putting the case at its strongest? Uh, that is the sense in which the, the thermometric scale remains ordinal rather than cardinal, yeah? 
uh, not picking out uh, a, a real quantity of a determinately objective property, yeah? Uh, and I, I found that a very, very interesting aspect <laughs> of, of, of both uh, uh, McCaskey's and, and Hassock's uh, discussion as well. And I think that too is well worth pursuing. So thanks again, Adrian. Oh, I have one little extra thought of where temperature, not quite temperature, but temper also occurs and uh, uh, where there is a scale as well. And that is in the 12 tone scale of music, yeah? Um, where what is sought when you're using it is called equal temperament, yeah? And the scale goes in pitch from low to high, yeah? I think that means that the use of temper and temperament, hence Johann Sebastian Bach's well-tempered clavier, yeah, where you mess with the equal intervals of, 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 of the tones to get it to play in all keys uh, um, uh, without adjustment. Um, uh, I think that is another temper type uh, uh, etymology to pursue and follow. You're de dealing, after all, with music as a quantified science. Yeah, sorry, that's just a final thought. <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you very much for all of those. I, 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 I simply agree with all of them. You know, I, I was aware, of course, of the, the brown red some years later, 15 or so years later, uh, after this early 40s work, picks up the Hales instrument and, and you know, some people say Brownrigg is the guy who invented the, the pneumatic trough. And I, I completely agree. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, a way of looking at it would be to say, it looks like there's a further discontinuity within Brown, you know, Brownrigg A is not the same as Brownrigg B. But yeah, this definitely needs pursuing. I, I, I completely agree. Similarly, what the hell does temperature mean and so forth? Yes, and quite right. Very big theme, both of the Chang book and of the McCaskey article, and a very important theme because we end up with, with, with something that we, we still regard as real. There's such a thing as absolute zero, but it's a, 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 a lot of work to get there, as, as both of those scholars have shown in their different ways. Uh, and the, the point of, about the... Um, uh, the Bach I, is wonderful. I would love to hear what John makes of that, John McCaskey. Fantastic. It's very interesting and important because it, it, it would appear to be a sort of straddling usage, wouldn't it? As you rightly say, it's both quantitative and qualitative, I think you could put it like that. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Is it possible to ask a question here? Um, John McCaskey, would you like to can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Carry on. What, what was the question you wanted me to answer? I, I, I just wanted you. To, I just um, wondered if you'd like to comment on what um, John and Adrian just been talking about, and sort of any other comments you might have. Yeah, the whole, the whole thing about music is fascinating. I, I had not thought of that. Um, that's a really cool you idea. That was interesting. Adrian, Adrian, I really like this. Um, where you're, you're highlighting something that I did not maybe highlight enough. Uh, well, you, you definitely. I mean, you're taking my you're taking my my narrative in a good in a fantastically interesting direction. Um, and the part that. I find most interesting is the risk of back projecting conceptually. You, I think, use that phrase, back projecting. We do it so often. Historians do it all the time. Philosophers do it all the time. I'm working on another big, huge project with the concept of induction. And we think we know what it is. We, If I walk into the room and say temperature or induction or scientific law, all the synapses fire and my colleagues ready to talk. But 
I often have to say, no, none of those things you just thought of have anything to do with the 16th century or the 14th century or classical Greece. It is so easy to back project our conceptual framework. And what I hadn't explored, and this is a fascinating possibility, is does it help us understand continuity versus discontinuity? And it's really cool, really cool idea, Adrian. I like this, I like this work a lot. Thank you very much indeed. That's a very that's lovely to hear. Yeah. Um it, it, it's just fascinating, isn't it? I mean, kind of everyone knows the I think the the the, the, the Toon's light personal light bulb moment. You know, when he realized that Aristotle's notion of place and space was not ours. You know, every historian of science knows that. And all that you've just said is, well, we should we should remember that <laughs> and apply it. And it's remarkable that we, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. It's very um, easy, very easy to make the mistake. Yeah. Our, our, our present uh, preconceptions are, and yes, pe people throw around words like inductions again. Yeah, we know what that means. Um, mm. uh, for example, when talking about bacon, um, you know, so many people think that by saying inductive, inductivist, they've described Bacon's approach method. And, well, well, they haven't begun to. Um, mm. Yeah, that's just one example amongst zillions. But yeah, I, so I, thanks. I find thanks. that congenial, and, and I'm, 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 this discontinuity thing fascinates me. That's a really interesting move. Thanks. Okay, any other comments or questions? Yes, uh, um, yes, or, Larry yeah. here. Can, can I ask a yeah. question? Uh, um, By all means, I'm quite, yes. I'm not a historian of chemistry either, I suppose. Uh, but I am very interested in a remark you made uh, quite early on about the pneumatic trough and the graph you showed, which indicated, I think, that the term pneumatic trough was, became much more widely used after 1800. Now, I, I can accept that that's about the term rather than the use, but let's leave that aside for the moment. But the question I have is, have you given any thought to why that should be the case? That's be, let me let me draw a, a kind of parallel. You mentioned in regard to temperature and Fahrenheit that this had something to do with Fahrenheit's entrepreneurial bent to try to have some consistency, which then therefore make it easier, I suppose, to exploit some kind of market. Can we could we use that same explanation as a way into why pneumatic trough became more acceptable? I don't know what, what's the right word here. For instance, people are, are making them and selling them. Yeah. What an interesting idea. That's a great hypothesis to play with. Well, thank you. I'll use it. <laughs> uh, it's a really, really nice hypothesis to play with. I, I, I think in general, attention to buying and selling and people who make instruments and people who make money out of making instruments and so forth um, has much more potential. I mean, historians of science are recognizing this, but it has much more potential than I think was appreciated, say, 20 years ago. You see, um, the thing is, you uh, can't. Across the, across the board. You can't, um, you, you couldn't generate, a, if you were Fahrenheit, you couldn't generate a market after, uh, to address a dozen people in Europe interested in the problem of temperature. Uh, there has to be something bigger. But, but and, and if I take that back in the pneumatic trough, it actually does interest me a lot. Then is it, 
that there are that many more people who are concerned with the use of the pneumatic trough or they just like to discuss it in those this chemistry in those terms i i'm not sure what the answer is i would only have to guess i wonder if either frank or john christie could usefully comment uh well i was going i was going to make a um comment and so refer particularly to anita mcconnell's Uh, work you. on Sylvester. Um, they, sorry, um, Anita McConnell uh, wrote some really nice work on various 19th century instrument makers a few years ago. Oh, and you. in that she, she argued that um, instrument makers had a sort of core business um, which would make their money. They would sort of um, make magnets for the Admiralty Chronometers for the Admiralty and so on and so forth, and that would generate their income. Work on these sort of uh, instruments that had no market outside that chemistry, and natural philosophy, and that's how she, uh, our, that's how she reckoned that um, you you sort of developed new in, new instruments, um, but you had a firm commercial base uh, on which to begin with. That's very helpful and interesting. Uh, would you be able to send me the reference to that in due course? Uh, yeah, I guess it is. Um, Thanks. John, did you, John, John? Um, uh, this is, uh, I don't have an answer to the very interesting question you've just been discovering. Um, it's, um, a sort of addendum I've thought of uh, on the temperature front. And it's what happens in Scotland after Black's formulation of the concepts of uh, heat capacity and of latent heat. And it's work done in Glasgow <coughs> by, uh, first of all, one of his pupils, William Irvin. This work is eventually published in the early 19th century. It was done in 1770s, 1780s. And that work was taken up by Adair Crawford in Adair Crawford's work on the theory of animal heat. And the specific concept uh, that emerged was called absolute heat. Yeah, which I think is uh, a chapter or a section of a chapter in the kind of longer story that uh, that John M uh, McCaskey has told us, the emergence of that concept of absolute heats. Yeah, um, again, a drive to uh, 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 specify the determinate objective uh, magnitude or value. Yeah, I just wanted to add that as worth further attention in the developing vocabulary of uh, of heat measurement. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Okay, well, it's, it's nearly six o'clock in London. Um, <clears throat> any final comments or questions before I before I wrap up? I'll see if I can turn my video on which has sort of taken a bit too much bandwidth today for some reason. Um, so just to say the next seminar in this series will be on the 18th of January when Sharon Rustin will be talking about the David Letters project and there uh, is a fighting chance that some, at least some of the, uh, sorry, David Notebooks project, there will be a fighting chance that some of the notebooks will be online uh, by that point. Uh, could I also remind everybody that on the 25th of this month, November, so a couple of weeks' time or so, uh, we've had the one-day in-person meeting at um, UCL on alchemy and chemistry in the long 18th century. And having seen the pro have written the program, I can assure you it is a, a very long 18th century uh, that, that we're dealing with. Um, so it just remains for me to um, thank... Um, 
everybody who's been involved in organizing uh, this seminar. Um, there's quite a lot of people who have to sort of are involved in one way or another. Uh, so that's Rob Johnson and the Karen Cobble, Becky Martin, Chris Campbell, and Joe Hedison. And it just remains for me to thank Adrian for providing a really interesting seminar that I think has provoked uh, a, sort of a really provocative um, discussion um, on, on 18th century chemistry. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian. Enjoy the rest of the day or evening where, wherever you happen to be in the, in the world. Okay, see you in January. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye.